slide, and I'll put and I'll put the slides there. So if you wanted to pull them down, uh, and also have a link to that at the end. They're not going to be on your I'm not sure. I'll check if I can post them there. Okay. Thanks for letting me know. Okay. Yeah, I had them posted on SlideShare, but uh, and I'll have that on the last slide. Uh, so my first story um, was from the 80s, the early 80s. The American automobile manufacturers were going to Japan to tour factories to try to understand okay, how are they uh, outperforming our factories. Um, after one of these trips, um, there was an MIT professor, a business school professor, that asked one of these Detroit executives, what did you learn from your trip? And he said, well, you know, I really didn't learn very much from this trip. Well, why is that? Said, well, um, well like they didn't show us the real factory. You know, they, I think they showed us a staged factory. Why did you say that? I said, well, because when we got there, there was no inventory anywhere in the factory. <laughs> and it was clean. And I've been in assembly production for 30 years, and that's not a real factory. So now in hindsight, we can we know that okay, if he had witnessed the beginning of lean manufacturing, he completely missed it. Uh, and uh, you know, it, it's interesting to look at from two points of view. One, you know, lean was about to really disrupt this whole industry. Back then, in America, six-week lead time, typically for a part, only 45% of projects finished on time. Uh, zoom forward to today, and you have three weeks of lead time, typically 95% success rate for completion times. But also, it was a good example of this Detroit executive living in the past, you know, 30 years of experience, really kind of closing his perspective, uh, being unable to see uh, what was coming. Uh, for me personally, I feel this way that I was this Detroit executive for when it comes to Agile and software processes. Um, when Agile first came on the scene, I really, I think I had some beliefs that were very skeptical about it. I was thinking, uh, okay, you know, it's more about the people and the technology, it's not the process. It even felt, I think I even felt a little cynical about it and thought, this is just self-serving, you know, the inmates are running the asylum. <laughs> uh, so my biases really held me back in this regard. Uh, so this story for me is, for the last 10 years I've been working in Pacific Biosciences, and we went from a you know, very traditional approach to software, and we've completely changed how we've done the instrumentation software. So I wanted to go through kind of what, what worked best for us, what some of the challenges were, Maybe there's something equally useful in there. Um, so where did my Detroit bias come from? I'm from Detroit. Uh, oh, we've got so many topics here. Just so I'm going to focus a little bit on testing first. We talk about hardware and, and the complexities of testing hardware, and then get into some of the Agile and DevOps pieces. Um, I'm actually from Detroit, but um, in terms of my career, uh, I went to MIT, then I went to Apple to work on the Mac software. When I got there, we were, you know, some of the operating system was still in the assembly language. When I left, we had gotten past that. Uh, the other main takeaway or learning for me there was, uh, initially we were doing these big bang releases every two years, every year. Uh, along the way, there was a shift to do smaller releases, maybe quarterly system updates. And really viscerally, it made a big difference for us. Like those big releases, very stressful, you know, if you feel like the next bus isn't leaving for a year, it drove everyone crazy. You know, get those last fixes in. There's tremendous pressure to go into a hero mode. Uh, when we moved to just quarter releases, uh, it, uh, it seemed to calm everyone down tremendously. Right? The next bus is leaving in three months. This, bu this bug's not going to make it. It's okay. I can live that long. What years were those? Uh, I was there in the 90s, basically. Yeah, it's all in the 90s. Then I went to uh, ONI Systems, a networking startup, startup company that did uh, fiber optic networking and the internal tools and a, de a deployment team. Uh, and that uh, was my first experience to say, hey, if you do a lot of deep automated testing, uh, how much can that make your life better? We went from having a nightly build and then taking about eight hours to manually test this kind of rack mounted fiber optic switching equipment to being able to have it tested automatically by the time we got in at seven in the morning. That made a huge difference for us. I uh, went to a couple, uh, another startup, and then did six years of consulting. There was a couple of failed startups in there I don't want to talk about with a couple of friends. Um, I took one year off uh, and went to a retreat center, just meditated for a year to recharge after that, and then went to PacBio. So I've been there 10 years this week. <laughs>
So briefly, what we do there, so we've done three platforms. Um, the last one looks the same. We reuse the skins, but the internals are very different. So that uh, these are DNA sequencers. So a scientist takes some, extracts some DNA from a tissue or an organism, puts it on the sequencer, designs an experiment, hits go. Um, internally, it's a lot of uh, um, illumination and optics. So we're using lasers to illuminate very small samples. Um, uh, the, the cameras in this first sequencer were so sensitive, uh, we had to get special dispensation to export it because it had, they had only been used in spy satellites before this. Um, but uh, we've been riding this wave of uh, cell phone camera um, uh, miniaturization and sensitivity and improvement this whole time. So this first sequencer uh, kind of maxed out around 1 billion DNA um, uh, nucleotides read, read out in an experiment. So you put the DNA in, you'd get in about a billion of the DNA molecules read out. Uh, the next sequencer caps out around 50 billion, and then the most recent one is capping out about 500 billion. So we're definitely beating Moore's law um, in these last 10 years. But it really just enables a lot more science. Like this one was great for doing bacteria, looking at disease resist you know, antibiotic resistance for bacteria. Uh, but as you get to this greater capacity and uh, cost, then you're starting to do human um, uh, you know, tumor samples, for example. Uh, there's a customer that's going to run 7,000 tumor samples next year with a couple of few sequencers just to try to understand a little better, okay, what are the mutate, you know, these complex gene fusion mutations and how does that relate to the cancer? Have you done Theranos? Theranos? <laughs> <laughs> these actually work. <laughs> so, sorry, that was it. Thank you. <laughs> so in terms of the software process, so we, when I showed up, you know, we were very much in a traditional approach, building hardware over the waterfall. Uh, the uh, big requirements up front um, and a big instrument. Um, the, uh, uh, it was really fun to work there because it's such a multidisciplinary group. There was chemists, physicists, uh, biologists, uh, doing some heavy signal processing. So just very interesting uh, engineering project. Uh, it's funny about that big up sort of upfront engineering, I'll mention that uh, the requirements up front is that um, after the after we we're done with this, moving on to the next sequencer, I, I did some code coverage on, okay, going end to end, doing an experiment, how much of our code is actually used? Any guesses for what percentage? 20? It was about that. It was about 20% <laughs> of our code was used. We had such big requirements up front that um, we had built all of this capability. Um, and in the end, you know, sort of your basic end-to-end -end cases, about 20% of the code was used. Um, if, I, if I'm generous and say, okay, maybe another 20% was for error handling and recovery, things like that, I, we probably could have finished in half the time if we had been more clear about what we needed to do or discovered in an agile approach. Uh, so this was an, this, uh, the rub here, and what was an interesting challenge for us in this was, the instrumentation is being used for the development of the biology and the chemistry. So they needed a stable platform. At the same time, as they're evolving, the, these uh, chemistry and biology, that was changing the requirements. So that was part of the challenge is that, you know, we, th we thought we were gonna end up here, the chemistry, the biology is evolving, we end up over here. Uh, but this is definitely the rub. It's amazing to me, I was so resistant to Agile when this was the chronic problem. In terms of software issues, the main ones, I think we had our, we have about 15 different compute um, devices inside here, a lot of real time. Um, you know, this, uh, this, there's basically a mini rack in here with all the compute for the signal processing. Uh, so the installation was challenging. There was ultimately just one person that could troubleshoot it, do it right. He became a real bottleneck and was adding lead time whenever we needed to do things. Uh, when we would install the new software, we would perform what we call a sanity test, basically a smoke test or a uh, uh, canary test. Yeah. I have a question. Was that because that person made their own problems, or is it, was it a hiring problem? You didn't hire enough people to test at that level. I don't mean you personally. Sure, sure. Right, yeah. yeah, no, I think it was just that it, partly it's the complexity and design for the tooling, like mm -hmm. from a, like a um, design ops kind of perspective, it was just that it was so complicated to use, you had to understand all of, you needed the, the mental model of how it all worked. Um, it wasn't designed to be push button at that point. Uh, 
And that was the real innovation in the next instrument that we applied to this was let's just do a integrated command line installer for that role so that anyone could do that. I wanted to kind of solve that pain point um, so that we wouldn't have a bottleneck to installing. So the sanity test was just a end -to simple end-to-end -end, you know, manual test um, uh, of the instrument. We were typically doing that after two weeks you know, kind of, of work. Every two weeks, we put the software together, we put it on there, we'd run it. Usually, it would take two to three days to actually debug that because there were so many changes that had gone in. Something had gone wrong. Uh, and, that w and we tried multiple times to automate that process and failed both times, or two, three times. We had some unit tests, but no real functional or integration testing. Um, and the, most of the computers in there were Linux boxes, but we were using Windows IDEs and then uh, cross-compiling running on Mono. So those are sort of the main pain points. Now, as we went to the next uh, instrument, we you know, started working, trying to knock these down. Um, from the very beginning of the development of that, we forked this code base. But started working on, you know, make sure we could automate end-to-end -end from the beginning. We had a uh, integrated Python interpreter in the main application, control application, which was really handy. You could you could basically log into a console in the, on, in the application and inspect state on any of the services that were running. That was pretty handy. Um, and you could execute some specific, you know, if you want to do some tests that way. But what we did for the second instrument was we added a cucumber style BDD framework on top of that. So that then for functional integration requirements, you could um, define what those use cases were for those modules, test them, and then because this is running inside the, the uh, application space, you could then inspect the state and then verify um, that your uh, use cases were met. Uh, and then just made sure that those tests could run both in the Linux environment and Windows environment, anticipating that some tests would fail in Linux and you'd want to be able to look, you know, reproduce it locally. What do you mean with the same way? Well, I. It's just that when running things on Linux, there's some, there was some small, I mean, it was a huge difference in the execution, but there's some small differences. So when we did these test frameworks, the key was, okay, make sure that they run in both environments. So you could do development of the tests locally and they would run the same way on the instrument um, and vice versa. Yeah. Simulation plus, if you want to say there's a, uh, this is more just a for that, but there is currently a Python framework that works differently between Mac OS and Linux. The way it was implemented on Linux devices, they've only just recently found it, but was used for a lot of scientific. Well, it was used for a lot of scientific research. The mm -hmm. library was meant to round for small quanta, um, and it rounded differently depending on what it was. But it also there was another problem in that it collected file names, and it uh, gathered the data from the file names, so it also read the wrong file names because mm -hmm. because Apple um, changed the blog. Uh, weird. Yeah. So it's just that kind of stuff. I wanted to yeah, just say that there are totally cross OS library issues that exist of what Lydia does. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, we we ran, I, I would say maybe 1% of the issues we'd run into were those, but there's such a pain to debug once we'd hit that stuff. Uh, so then another thing that was, it, it, you know, nor, when we're doing the development of the second instrument, there was a point at which the electronics taped out uh, to get manufactured. So we had about a three month gap before those boards came back in. And normally I think our process would have been, well, okay, we're just gonna write a lot of code, write some unit tests, and then when the hardware arrives, we'll start debugging it. In this case, we said, oh, let's experiment with doing some deep simulation. So during that time, we, we tried to go through and write uh, simulators for each of the hardware devices, the third party hardware devices and our boards before they arrived. Um, and we had just about enough time uh, to then also add some of the functionality using those simulators. It worked out really well in the short term. We had, uh, when the boards came in, in some cases a board would come up immediately, like that same day, we actually could use, you know, the functionality uh, uh, was there. In some cases a week or two. But the real payoff was long term, uh, in part because this equipment's expensive, we couldn't get very much of it. You're doing development and testing on the same boxes typically. Uh, so then once we had enough simulation, we could spin up virtual instruments. So I could pick up, you know, I take VMs, spin up five or six of the, our instruments, and especially with those functional integration tests, I can run those um, at the same time. So our test automation went from being just unit tests to then having these simulated functional tests, simulated integration tests, and even simulated end-to-end -end for the instrument, and then having the push question sanity, you know, sanity tests. Uh, we've since then added some performance stress and chaos testing to it. 
code coverage. I, I feel a little dubious about saying code coverage because, you know, it, it's measuring does the does these tests hit this code line once? You know, it's not really telling me if the uh, the tests are really taking all the code paths that I'm interested in. But what we, I will say we got out of this was it was great for gamifying the team, right? Like we went from about 20, 25% code coverage um, to about a year, getting to about 80%. And it just inspired people to write a lot of tests. And it did tell us if a particular piece of code had no testing whatsoever. So it was useful for that. But with the caveat that, you know, you can, you can certainly fool yourself with it. Do your tools not look at different branches? At least not this, the code coverage we have. You know, it's a little more kind of just... Did, have we, line get hit? did we get hit this line? Yeah. Did you have any other metrics for your tests? Uh, let's see. Well, I'll, I'll get to some more metrics later. But um, this was, I think, the main one. At least this got us from a, from a culture change point of view. I think that's my biggest challenge has been, you know, especially if for you know folks that have been programming for a long time. How do you shift to a you know more of a test driven mindset? I will say that this did help us personally. Like we we got excited about okay writing more tests and. Um, that was an accomplishment, I thought. Yeah. You, you have a pretty complex tool with a lot of scientific parts, right? Mm -hmm. Do you separate technical software and scientific algorithmical software? Because kind of different timing, timeline, different... Yeah, great question. That's yep. how you deal with all the same code, the same test approach. Yeah, if, if I can rephrase your question, see if I get it right. Is, Mostly, I've been talking here about the control of the instrumentation, but then, like this depth, the, the signal processing that we're doing, um, uh, is that a different animal? You know, is that is that apply to this type of uh, approach, for example? Yeah, I am mostly focusing on the control instrument control side, uh, but yeah, I'll come back to that. I think uh, the uh, on this, I do feel like that if you're working in an algorithm and you're going to be doing that for a few months, does that fit into an agile process, or does it make more sense to have? That, that engineering role, you know, really just have time to think hard about it uh, and not be forced into two week sprints. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Um, so on the on the testing on hardware, uh, we started off with just being able to push the button and run, runs, okay, great. But then once we got in some Atlassian tools and we're setting up our, you know, automation to run overnight, you know, we really upped the cadence to it. We added more types of these. So a diversity of these kinds of on hardware tests, that was helpful. But the main takeaway for me was once we got the number of commits going into each test down, it made a huge difference to our efficiency. You know, like initially, if you're getting 20 or 30 commits in, something goes wrong, there's a certain cognitive load to figure out which commit caused the problem. Um, as we upped our test cadence, so we're you know, now doing about four builds a day typically and running tests across all of those builds, now I'm much closer to one commit, one set of tests. If something breaks, I know instantly what, was, what went wrong. Um, it really speeds us up. Um, I'd even argue that um, I'd want to do more tests per commit. Uh, and that's just because, especially when I'm dealing with hardware, there's a diverse, there's a little bit of diversity in the hardware, even if it's designed to have the same tolerances, there's going to be a little bit of diversity in the hardware. Um, and at the end of the sprint, I want to know, statistically, do I have high reliability? Are there any low incidence failures that have crept in? The only way I know that is I have to do a lot of these tests and experiments to see. Okay, yeah, I've done hundreds of runs. Now I know I'm still at an okay reliability level. Yeah. How expensive are these tests? Usually, take a long time to run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a mix of them in here. Um, I see our base one was taking about an hour. We have some faster ones. It depends on whether or not we're doing the full robotics workflow. Well, I can imagine I can imagine I pushed out a commit and I've broken something. Yep. But the unit test doesn't pick it up, but the iteration test does. Yep. You run like staggered different things, so like. I now it's a minute and an hour yep. tomorrow something on fire. Yeah, I'll, I'll get a little bit more to what we did with the automate, you know, sort of with that level of testing, but in brief, yeah. So we, we did move to a GitFlow model where we have short-lived feature branches, and then we're doing continuous integration tests with, on those simulated instruments. So we'll spin up five imaginary simulated instruments, run them through a battery test. There'll be unit tests to run, but all of these end-to-end -end tests will run. We'll have a mix of those end-to-end -end tests uh, before we're allowed to then merge to develop. But then these tests are basically our trunk. You know, we're testing trunk with this generally. Yeah. I, I may have missed this, but what language, what language or languages oh, yeah. is your software written in? Sure, it's a mix. There's the instruments are the control is mostly done in C sharp with these Python test libraries. Um, 
Uh, and then we use the Python also for the diagnostics. So the self-test of the instrument, we basically reuse a lot of the test code as the diagnostic self-test code. Uh, that, that's been handy. Uh, but then for like signal processing, that's been mostly C++. And, uh, uh, and then the interface is written in TypeScript. Uh, and then it's using a RESTful interface to get state from the instrumentation. Can you share a little bit more about the simulated instruments and, uh -huh. and the delta between the through simulations and you know actual full integration? From the from at least from the our application code point of view, we try to get it so that we it can't tell if it's running in a simulator or not. Um, and I think that was a key advantage. Oh. So that you know at least when we're running the test, it should run the same way. Um, other distinctions. Um, one thing that's been helpful is, you know, with the simulator, like I, we can instrument all these failure cases and recovery modes that I can't do on hardware. In that case, is the simulation is better. You know, I can have it fail eight ways every day and um, ensure that you know, the right notification is happening to the customer, um, the right recovery is applying, things like that. Um, is your simulation written in C sharp? Most, yeah, it's also written in C sharp. Yeah. Well, we talked a lot about like what happens when develop, like what it takes to merge to develop. Yep. Are your developers also running tests on their local environments? Yeah, they can. I we have enough uh, sort of build capacity VMs that you you know people can commit push to a, a branch and have the VMs handle it if that's helpful if they're switching between branches. But yeah, it's part of the design was be able to run all your tests locally as well. You know, basically you have all the same simulation locally. And that's been helpful, uh, especially if you want to step through with your you know set breakpoints in your simulator, see what's happening. Uh, let's see, so batch size reduction, um, running more tests per commit just to make sure that you can get a, a good confidence, statistical confidence in it. Uh, the, I think the indication that, that we were onto something was when one of the engineers came to me and said, we're never going back to the way we used to do things. <laughs> that, they're, you know, that this has been such a life-changing experience for us. You know, when we went to the second instrument uh, design, we forked the code, but then from now on, it really feels like we have the confidence we can refactor support multiple platforms at once, not have a lot of fear that we're making changes that are going to be disruptive, mostly because of that test coverage. Um, does this scale? So our team is relatively small. I learned recently that the HP LaserJet team went through a very similar transition uh, a couple years before us, where and they have a 400-person engineering team. Originally, they had silos for different uh, LaserJet printers, and they were spending an inordinate amount of time porting features from printer to printer and then manually testing. So uh, Gary started a transformation where they initially wrote hardware simulators for all 25 or so laser jet printers, went deep on that. Um, and then they started working the same way, kind of building the, the test coverage and then moving towards a single trunk um, development. You know, So one code base, all 20 some printers. Um, and then they're running those simulated tests 10, 15 times a day across all the printer families. Um, and then he, he sort of described the payoff. Before all of this, they were doing, just doing so much overhead for that porting work that maybe only 5% of their time could be devoted to feature development. When they were finished, it was more like 40% of their time could be for feature development. So it was just a huge change of life for them. Complexity. So this one's, it's been interesting to work on such a complicated instrument for me personally. I hadn't done something like this before. Um, we had these wild bugs, like, uh, for example, one on, the, on our first instrument, we had there was 14 machine vision cameras to help the robotics do pick and place, um, firewire-based cameras. Once in a blue moon, the firewire network would reset, right? And if you, I don't know if you know firewire, but the cameras are identified um, dynamically, and if something happens to one of the cameras, the network will just reassign which camera is where. And, uh, um, this was maddening to try to debug, right? Because we couldn't reproduce it locally. Um, everything works generally fine. Um, eventually, I think we had to go in and instrument the kernel to understand what FireWare was doing when this happened to pinpoint it to, as you'd imagine, it's the camera that was attached to the robot that's moving around a lot. Uh, long story short, what, what, what was causing it is the cable routing for this FireWare cable. I mean, the cables were screwed in. They were doing the right thing there. Someone had the zip tie too tight sometimes on some of the instruments. That took a long time to figure that one out. Uh, so I, my experience in this has been that, you know, or my bias, my, my belief, 
my preceding bias had been that well, software is deterministic, right? I run the same test twice, I should get the same results. Um, I'm increasingly appreciating how just the, you know, the hardware adds all kinds of interesting things to it. Um, these are all hand built, There's, they're calibrated. Uh, even the parts you know, will have tolerances, but you bolt them together and those tolerances stack up. Um, no, two, no two of our instruments are exactly the same. Uh, another related problem was, you know, just a cable is a little bit too tight. Things get, you know, they're rotated, you know, six microns, you know, things like that. Yeah. So, uh, are you running onboard tests at post deployment to identify those issues? Yeah, and and doing a lot of telemetry too. So, a big part of this is trying to understand, uh, and I'm kind of uh, getting ahead of myself a little bit, but, you know, uh, when you get uh, interesting um, failures that are, that it's not clear that the cause and effect might be. Then yeah, how do you approach those problems? That's I think that's a, a really interesting aspect of this to me. Was you know what do you use? Um, so telemetry has been very helpful. Like that, for example, that rotation because the cable is a little bit too tight. You know we're 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 trying to take a lot of measurements, and each instrument is sending back a couple megabytes worth of telemetry every day. Um, but it's hard to know what's useful information. A lot of it's just noise until you start to see the problem. Um, there's some good algorithms for anomaly detection, but you know, for me, I, I've gotten a little cynical about uh, predictive failures. Some devices we've gotten some good predictive failures on it, um, but uh, in some cases, like I remember, we had a laser that we tried really hard to get predictive when this laser will fail, and at most we get about 12 hours advance notice. And um, exper some of our experiments were running for days, so it's not that wasn't that useful. Is that still ongoing? That predictive issue with the uh, troubleshooting failure. I think it's, yeah, I think that's a useful concern. I mean, there's some components in here where we do monitor um, uh, all the, the fleet of instrumentation and see, okay, how is it going? And we do have good signal there. But I, but I think we've gotten into this almost bad habit of saying, oh, I'll add some metrics and we'll figure out later if they're useful. And now we're just, you know, there's hundreds of things we're gathering and it's just, uh, you know, uh, I worry a little bit we need to be better about following through, like generating tools to look at the telemetry when, whenever we add the telemetry. That would be one. Do you use elastic? You mentioned you use elastic. Elastic? Uh, you mean like a like on the back end for the telemetry or? For no, for your working. Elastic. No. Yeah. Okay. So complexity. So my here's my first of many book recommendations. Um, Sydney Decker uh, is a professor of safety. Um, this book is uh, was a, it's. Hmm. He's mostly looking at complexity. You know, when we when we think about cause and effect in failures, because he really studies catastrophes, um, there's this tendency, I think, a cultural tendency to say, okay, there must have been caused by a broken part. You know, we're looking for a simple cause and effect relationship to what caused this failure. Um, and uh, he, he, in the book, he gives a number of case studies, like in the healthcare industry, in mining, um, and, and uh, the first example he gives is this uh, doomed, um, unfortunately, Alaskan Airlines flight. Um, where uh, this MD-80, so this is a while ago, um, was flying from Mexico to Seattle. Flight was perfectly fine up until about LA, and then the pilots heard a loud thunk sound from somewhere back in the plane. Immediately the plane dove, they, you know, they put all of their force into, the, in, into holding it into place and they were able to stabilize the plane. So at that point they're thinking, okay, do we divert to Los Angeles, do we try to troubleshoot it? Um, they decided to troubleshoot it, they did some things, thought it was somewhere in the tail of the plane that was going on, and then they heard another even louder thunk. The plane dove again. This time they couldn't pull it up. It dove 30 degree down angle, 70 degree down angle, 90 degree down angle. They're over the Pacific. Continued, inverted. The MDID is flying upside down at this point, and they were trying to roll it at that point, um, but they lost control. Uh, no one survived. But the first thing, of course, people are looking for is what's the broken part, right? They did, uh, was able to collect the plane and all the information from the plane. They found that sure enough in the tail of the plane, there was a control rod with screws called a jack screw. Um, and it had sheared and that had forced, you know, one of the control planes into an extreme position. Uh, so, okay, problem solved. It's a broken part, right? So then he dives into, well, okay, what's the, what's the maintenance of that part? What's the history of that part? 
Um, and then you start to get to, so you start to see the complexity of the system start to evolve, right? Like, so this part is supposed to be lubricated every so often, it shears down, there's a measurement device, but then you gotta start to put yourself in the shoes. The maintenance workers sitting in a cherry picker 40 feet off the ground, there's an access panel to look at that screw. It barely fits your hand. It's night, it's probably raining, and you're trying to take a measurement of this thing, right? And you're not even sure if the tool you're using to measure has been calibrated. Um, so that, that this is starting to see the picture as you get the, you know, start to look back to it. And then you look at, okay, what's the maintenance interval for this? Uh, because over time, how often this is lubricated and how often this is checked has changed. So back in the 60s, they were checking it this often. Dereg airline deregulation happens, then they start to have these longer windows. Now the decisions to do the longer maintenance windows seemed reasonable at the time. There haven't been any failures. We can, you know, we can widen it a little bit, widen it a little bit, widen it a little bit. No one had looked back at the original design uh, requirements to see, oh, does that make sense? By the time this particular failure happened, the plane had uh, been in a maintenance interval, failed measurement, the next, so they're going to ground the plane. The next morning, the next maintenance crew comes and says, oh, we'll measure it again, passes the measurement. But then the plane goes into service and actually makes it all the way almost to their next maintenance interval, like they're about to go into maintenance when it failed. So you get the sense of, you know, and I think his, his point is mostly that, you know, even if you're, you know, you're thinking that it's a, a clear cause and effect relationship in these, you know, when you're looking at failures or bugs, um, really there's a field, a complex field that's what's happening. And it's, uh, it's important to keep in mind that our bias might be to look for a broken part, or if there's a, uh, it could be a thinking, okay, who caused this bug? Like you might be thinking broken person almost, but really it's a, it's a complex, uh, situation that we're working in really, especially for hardware. Uh, this uh, Kinevin framework, uh, I want to make sure to pronounce it that way because it's a Welsh word and it looks nothing like the way it's spelled. Um, so the Kinevin framework came out of IBM and I think it's also helpful for me uh, in this, looking at, okay, for different domains, what is uh, straightforward for cause and effect and what is a more complicated environment where we can't easily determine cause and effect. I think mostly, unless you're talking about an algorithm down, you know, you'll have really deterministic understanding maybe there. Mostly we work in this realm where, you know, you have to investigate a bug a little bit to understand it. Um, but I think it's really interesting when we get into these complex worlds where we have lots of components um, and the interactions between them are creating, you know, the components might be behaving to spec, um, but then you add in this interaction and you get these complex failures. Um, Netflix really, uh, sort of led on this, uh, in my opinion. Um, a, a great example of that is when the AWS US East region went down one day, and a number of websites went down, Reddit went down, just a, a lot of properties went down, but, uh, but Netflix did not go down. And there were rumors swirling like, oh, you know, maybe Amazon gave them a sweet deal because they're their big customer. And, you know, maybe they have another reason we don't know about. Um, but then uh, Adrian Krakow uh, and a couple of his managers pushed, put out a blog post shortly thereafter explaining how did they stay up. Um, and uh, it basically described how they had um, really in their architecture from the beginning said, okay, when we move to AWS, we're gonna try to make sure that we can degrade at every level cleanly. Like if I, I can't give customers their personalized movie recommendations, we'll give them static ones, you know, something at least. Um, uh, if Expecting a server to go down, we're going to use really tight or slow time or short timeouts and switch up fast switchovers. And that would apply both within a domain but also to other regions. And that was sort of the main way they were surviving this. Um, but then additionally, they're going to actually test in deployment. Uh, you know, we test in deployment and so do you. Kind of this sense of, you know, we're going to uh, kill servers in production and make sure that we can stay up and survive that. Uh, so that's, I think this is a really exciting uh, sort of fallout of looking at complexity and saying, hey, you know, we can't understand the cause and effect of our system fully. The only way we can do that is to probe it and inject failures and then make sure that you see how it behaves and sense how it behaves. And that's an important aspect. Once you're in a complicated domain, that's one of the things that comes out of this is that, you know, you really can't reason about a complex system so much. You really need to probe it and then sense how, how it responds to your environment. So do you have um, examples of, uh, you know, things you injected to test your... Yeah, so the things that we're doing personally is, uh, you know, it, uh, so we can inject failures, like I, 
there's, uh, for example, some of the analytics pipelines, uh, we run tests where we'll go in and we'll kill minus nine different aspects of the pipeline and then make sure that it comes back up okay and we can recover. Um, uh, in terms of latency is a big one for me because you know you get a lot of variability. Um, some, sometimes even it's like, you know I'm talking to a laser, they do a silent revision to the firmware of these lasers. New lasers are coming into manufacturing, and they're getting put in the instrument, and the timing is way significantly different you know, on how they behave. So in the tests, adding latency, so instrumenting, you know, just making sure that you're, you're, you're seeing a lot of variability in how the system behaves. Um, starving for resources, you know, explicitly starving for resources. So those are some things that we've done. Yeah. And it has really helped. I think it has. We have some tests that mostly run on the weekends that just torture uh, our uh, instruments. Um, and you really start to see stuff pop out that you wouldn't see otherwise. Uh, but then some things are going to go wrong anyway, even with all of that effort. Um, my, uh, we had a time bomb. Uh, this is still my favorite bug at this company so far. So one Sunday night, I, I, I checked my email. I made the mistake of checking my email. And someone had uh, been setting up a test remotely. They installed some new software, and they restarted the instrument, and it wouldn't come up. So I thought, OK, you know, I'll log in. You know, it's pretty easy for me. I can SSH to this particular instrument. Um, and luckily, you know, the logs were very clear. They had a nice stack trace. I pulled up the code that related. So within 10 minutes, I knew we were completely screwed. <laughs> <laughs> This piece of code, it was just a little profiling piece of code. So in hindsight, later, I discovered the provenance of this code. Um, it was a, you know, it was designed for performance profiling. It had gone from millisecond timing to microsecond timing, back to millisecond timing. It had been deleted and then reconstituted and moved around. Somewhere along the way, it had picked up an integer overflow. And it was still functioning. It was still monotonically increasing in its counts, but with negative numbers. It took eight years to get to zero on that Sunday. So this code was in there for eight years. We hadn't even been using it for years, right? Like this, the fact that this technical that was sitting around was interesting. Um, but you know, so when the instrument came up, it's you know getting all of its pieces ready to go, and kaboom! And we couldn't start up because of that. You know, it hit zero and everything failed. Um, my, uh, we we went into firefighting mode. Luckily, we were able to you know create a patch, turn it around, test it, and get it out to customers within about 24 hours. So I, you know, I think my takeaway from that one is. It really helped to have those logs, to have that to clear understanding of what was happening so we could quickly resolve it and then have some ability now to test quickly and get things out quickly. That was fine. I don't know of any other good defense besides getting rid of all that technical debt. Yeah. So when you are deciding on the telemetry side, you guys pick up the specific telemetry side? No, for us, it's mostly just being very verbose. I mean, it helps that we have a big instrument, so I have enough to space I can log for days, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but then also we've put, put some real effort into having more structured data for metrics. Um, and that helps on the back end when you're doing the you know, analysis of the data. So you kind of have both worlds. Uh, that's most of what I mean by our telemetry. But, yeah. When you said that you had your update and hotfix push out in 24 hours, what does your update to production or customer machine look like? Do they keep their machines on the internet as a request by you so that you these Most of our customers are internet connected. Yeah, that really helps. Both from getting the telemetry, but then also in order, in order to go in and make adjustments or fix things or apply a patch. Yeah, that's really helpful. How do you handle the ones that are not internet connected? Someone's got to fly out there. Yeah, it's a huge support cost. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of Agile, um, how am I doing that time? Uh, we, so most of what I've talked about was pre-Agile process. So we got a lot of the benefit just from really going deep on the testing and the infrastructure. Um, we more recently moved to a Scrum model. I think I would, what I wanted to highlight here is this: the production teams are doing Scrum, but one of the problems we ran into is we have all these other teams that I mentioned, right? There's the chemists, the biologists, there's tech support, there's hardware. They're all feeding us requests. Um, making what we're working on visible was super helpful, but then also setting them up with their own Kanban boards that they could manage and then having a meeting where all the stakeholders are involved to then feed their requests into our backlog, um, also calm things down. So there's a sense of being able to have visibility of seeing everything that they're looking for, um, having everyone involved in that decision. Because before we did this, it was, oh, hey, Joe, can you help me with this? Oh, Cindy, can you please implement this? Right? It was very disruptive. Like There's all these different teams coming at us, and everyone wants to be helpful. Um, so that, that I think that 
kind of gave us a sane way of managing what's coming in. Um, another thing that we looked at a little bit is just the definition of done because these teams are, you know, are, are the, the quality of the requests is all over the map. So uh, like for example, in the title of each request, you would put just in capital letters blocked if we did not have enough information in the request to uh, make it actionable, right? So if that request was still missing um, important requirements, you know, we'd have to make sure that someone was working to fill those in. So we knew what done meant in this context before it was playable. Uh, that really helps. Otherwise, before that, we were getting, you know, these one line uh, stories would come in. Uh, and then you're like, what do I do with this exactly? Yeah. So did you have Monday's really scrum or, or is it? No, just the software teams. Yeah, mostly the main production teams. For internal tools groups, they kind of live on Kanban boards and are on their own uh, cadence. Um, but for the production oriented teams. Yeah. So, how would they get to know their block, say, a chemist or a Someone has to drive. I mean, it was really a, you know, okay, if there's a story that you're, you need a champion for the story, otherwise it's going to sit in the backlog and no one's going to be flushing it out. Yeah. Did you have any scale agile frameworks? Did you have save for strongest ROMs? No, just, just simply, yeah, just sort of, this is as far as we, we've gotten with um, doing, doing Scrum. And I, and to your point earlier, uh, Sergey, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think we have found that when uh, there's certain engineering groups that, we're doing more algorithmic development. Uh, it felt a little bit like shoehorning them into a Scrum model when they're doing a three-month-long uh, investigative work on a piece of, uh, in like a new algorithm, for example. Um, and so far, it's felt like we're gonna, you know, it's been better, I think, to move that kind of work onto a Kanban board where they can be self-managed and not have to deal with the Scrum overhead. Yeah, you know, I don't know that term, Kanban board. Kanban board. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. So that's more of a lean manufacturing approach of just having a, a, a work in process limited um, sequence where there's a backlog in what's what's being worked on and not necessarily having a kind of two week, you know, a cadence or like a two week cadence. Yeah. Uh, we went to the last thing, tool chain, Git flow I mentioned, and I mentioned pull requests. That, I think the pull request has been one of the main benefits of that for us, just getting more peer reviews. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about what of the Atlassian tool chain we're using a full, a full suite for everything so that we get the integration between, um, and it's all on-prem, but uh, you know, source code's in Bitbucket. Um, we're using Jira for all of our management, and we're using Bamboo for all of our both build and test automation. So it, it's been decent for getting traceability between, you know, like, okay, where did this commit go, and what build is it in? Um, I wouldn't say it's great, but it's. I think it has been helpful to have those integrated mm -hmm. tools. Uh, not enough yet. It's yeah. It would be experiment a little bit with pairing, um, and I think it's up to the team for for each person to sort of decide what kind of pull request um, code reviews that they want to do. But yeah, I do feel like pairing might be a a, a, a way for us to level up next further. Yeah. Uh, we also do chip design. The manufacturing for the chip design. Um, kind of uh, comes in for us much more downstream. Like We're not really involved in that, but. Oh, yeah, that's, I'm impressed. Uh, let's see, oh, this was another one that uh, a former head of software brought in that I thought, thought was helpful. So for each Scrum sprint, someone it rotates around, this person becomes the triage person. And uh, we called it the purple hat. We give them a purple hat, stick it on their desk. But the idea is then any production you know, issues that are coming up during that sprint, everyone goes to that person. So that then the rest of the team can maintain their flow and they're not disrupted. Um, but then you know, we don't get that many of those issues, so then that person can focus on technical debt reduction. And, that, and then we rotate that around. It can be a good way to kind of learn more about the, you know, their area or their related areas. So that's been a nice role. Uh, I was gonna make a plug for Ron, if you haven't seen any of Ron's talks so far. Um, I love his book. Uh, I saw, an, I think, an earlier, shorter version of his Nuance Technologies talk, so I totally recommend going to that tomorrow. Um, and he's talking later today at five. This is a little bit more about software management, but yeah, I think there's a lot, talks a lot about Agile, too, in, uh, in that. So in terms of DevOps, uh, we've done a pretty good job with the architecture so that the teams can work independently and we don't have a lot of friction where the teams need to interact and uh, uh, get buy-in with each other. So having those API separations has been very helpful for Flow. You mentioned the telemetry. 
We just more recently started tracking the change failure rate and the mean time to resolve issues as a way to look for something that we can improve. Um, but we're not, not releasing very often to customers. Our customers are pretty resistant to software releases. So mostly what I'm doing in here is tracking our internal customers. Like, okay, how often am I um, able to release to the chemistry teams and the biology teams uh, and make things useful for them? Um, how often are, are my commits failing, you know, causing problems for them? How quickly do I turn this around? It's still been useful. Yeah. Regarding uh, customer <laughs> resistance to change, um, um, I'm gonna make I'm gonna make the assumption. Please correct me that they are resistant to changes in their workflow, uh -huh. but not resistant to changes at the low level that they would impact. Or are they also resistant? To that? Also resistant to that. So, for example, like if a customer is gonna run seven thousand tumor samples, they want to do a uh, validation of their process on one version of software, and then they're gonna stick with it until the project's over. I think it's possible to do more releases, uh, but. Um, not to all customers at all times. So you really have to kind of pick things that would work for some, you know, when they have gaps in their project schedule. Uh, and then feature flags. This we have some global flags, but we we clustered flags around each service inside of our application. So we have like an XML configuration for each service. So it's like 150 services. Um, they each have their own flags. That's been pretty handy, you know, when you're doing um, development to say oh, I want to turn this on and off in testing or during early development or uh, build something out that doesn't go to everyone, just goes to one instrument. Uh, so having the flags separated out by service has been helpful. So are those flags runtime flags or they can be time? mostly they're no they're not they're all runtime. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Runtime flags. I don't I don't know what the count would be at, you know we also run into this problem. I think we probably have over a thousand flags now and you know so mm -hmm. we've got to the point now where it's like I have no idea what that flag does. I don't want to touch it. <laughs> right? It means so, you're shipping code to customers that may or may not run depending on well, the flags are generally, we do have this notion of kind of the software release set of flags or configuration. And then anything beyond that that's per instrument is a deviation. So those are really only done with, like a, an example might be, um, I have a fan, that's a semi-redundant fan, fan goes out, uh, causes, you know, could cause an alarm to the customer. We've just, you know, talked to the customer about decided, okay, they don't want to see that alarm anymore, so we'll use a feature flag and then turn off that particular, um, Right. How much configuration is the customer capable of on these machines? Not much. They, they, I mean, I think there is some flexibility. And in fact, those first instruments, a couple customers have just completely gone, create, you know, done some interesting things with them. But for the most part, it's they just want they want it to work. They put their DNA DNA in, it go. Yeah, so they don't have control of it. Yeah, no, they don't. Yeah, no, it's really more for tech support if we wanted to work around an issue that they're having. Yeah, but still, you've got the code in there that's not that's actually not intended for those customers. Potentially, but it, but it is in fact there. So yep. you know, that seems yep. like a the risk profile is a little higher than you know, than not having it there. Yeah. 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 Does it also take to turn on all these machines and bring them back up to operational state? About fifteen minutes. The power so cycle. So you don't have to like lightly revise everything. You just like the solution is not really working. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So retrospectives, we've done some with retrospectives. Uh, I think the main, you know, my main point here is that, you know, if we have a sanity failure, there's an opportunity, you know, that's, it's a more expensive test. There's an opportunity to then look and say, can we shift left and write a test further upstream that would catch these problems? But that requires really looking at, okay, you know, just fixing that individual failure um, might not be predictive of the next one you're going to find. So we did use the Toyota 5Ys approach to try to dig deeper on each failure um, with the caveat that you're not going to see uh, complex systems, you're not necessarily going to have cause and effect for all of these cases. So for me, it was just more of a, you know, let, let's see, can we go beyond the immediate failure? Um, and then the other main thing is, you know, just to be very careful to make this a blameless process. Um, because again, there's this cultural bias to say, oh, this is a broken part, a broken person. Um, to really, th this process really needs to be very much about this, the system, the tooling, the processes, what we're doing. It's never the person. Really, never the person. And then this is another book recommendation. Oh, I'm forgetting my book recommendations. So let's see this. This uh, I recommend this book <laughs> for sure. Uh, but then this is another one by Sidney Decker, and it, he's really talking about retributive versus restorative justice, um, but in the context of high reliability organizations, looking at healthcare organizations. Um, uh, it's, it's, you know, all of Sydney's books, I have to warn you that, you know, like 
like the airplane crash, don't read that book while you're flying the plane. <laughs> don't read this book before you go into a healthcare situation. <laughs> right? Um, but he, but he calls out all these case studies where it's like, you know, in one case in the UK, there was a nurse that, you know, there was, there was a fatality, the nurse was blamed, um, and it, it, they ignored the systemic issues that related to, how, you know, how that particular fatality had occurred. She went to jail. The um, self-reporting of incidents in that hospital dropped in half for the next four years, right? Like using a retributive system clearly affected the ability, the organization's ability to learn. Um, so that's kind of the strong part of the strong argument for this in terms of retrospectives. But a great book. Uh, on deployments, I was saying we, we have a lot of friction with our customers. I think the, the biggest win for us lately has been, you know, getting a subset of customers to do um, early access installs, and we can get some sense of, you know, how things are doing on the, you know, the, uh, the some subset of the population of our instrumentation. Um, it feels like the ideal model would be, and I know that the Fitbit does this. Where you do a one percent rollout and a five percent and a ten percent rollout before you go to the whole fleet, um, and uh, and even better if you can fit your firmware, you know, two copies of everything on the device and then do a switch back if you see an issue, um, a blue green deployment pattern. pattern um, just, I'd recommend that uh, uh, for a lot of reasons. You know, like uh, yeah, maybe you can reinstall, but it's just such a it, it uh, such a headache if you don't have that. Uh, and then who else does this? So Tesla's unique in that they have an API where you can you can uh, share what version of firmware your car is running. So there's a few thousand people that have been posting their firmware versions to a couple of websites. So then you can go back and look and see, okay, how often does Tesla release software for their cars? It turns out they do it a lot. Uh, three years ago, they were releasing a new version of software every uh, seven days. Uh, two years ago, it was every six days. This year, it's every five days. Uh, and I saw a job description that they had on their careers board where they they said, um, if you, uh, if you, you know, if you work here, you will push code to production cars within the first week of working here. <laughs> Maybe they need to get a new like, uh, SSD algorithm or something to prevent their working problems. So, they are, if you look closely, they, they, it's a little hard to see, sorry, this VGA monitor, but uh, they, they are pushing really to a small subset. So it's really about 1% of the cars are getting each one of these builds. About once a quarter, once every six months, they bring everyone up to a new firmware revision. But they're really sampling, you know, across the cars. Do you have any policy about logging? A policy about logging? Well, yeah, we do have to be careful. So, you know, our logs are obfuscated so that no customer sample information is included. There's no risk of a kind of a HIPAA escape of information. Uh, and we have to do that on the client side before any, any tele telemetry is moved back. And it's part of our customer agreement, you know, that we ask if we can take telemetry. And not all customers do. Uh, yeah. can, can you say anything about um, your process for writing test code, whether it's unit test code or, or at a higher level test code? Is it is software developers writing it? Is it separate team writing it? Yeah. Also, yeah, we don't have we have uh, we have one person on the team that's a uh, SDT, um, is focusing on tests, but he's mostly focusing on the infrastructure and most and lately on the chaos testing, coming up with new tortures for the instruments. So developers are writing tests and for the functional their, integration. For their own yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm curious who who here has are there any folks here that don't have any test teams or uh, you know that test function. Yeah. A separate team for testing versus <laughs> part of the Yeah, not silent. Yeah, if you're small, you might not have the next separate testing. Yeah. Who is writing your NFR? Who's writing your NFR? NFR is no. Oh. Um, yeah, it's a good question. That's a, that's a very rich question because it's we're getting requests from so many different places, um, and internal requests, um, and then flushing out those requirements really becomes multi-stakeholder sometimes. Um, so I don't have a single answer for you. Our marketing department is the product owner, um, but then they're they're needing to get help all the time on a lot of the technical issues. Yeah. You mentioned you uh, you were flying uh, your tests and other tests. Yeah. It's Really, so we found that it's really easy to get a human telling you're writing these garbage tests. Where it's like, who, who 
Sandy checks the tests for like, is this a new testing or is it just like, you know, low low testing? Yeah, thanks. Thank you for putting that up because that is a good caveat for the code coverage. So you can get great code coverage and it's like, you're really not doing much. Um, yeah, it's really up to the engineers and our, at least our team to, you know, decide and design what tests make sense. Um, and then part of the PR process to then review it. Yeah, to some degree. I think it really is up, up to the teams to decide, you know, okay, what's the right level of uh, scrutiny? Yeah. Right. If yeah. you make a goal that people really put a goal in, it's bad. Definitely. So do you, especially with your low-level tests, like unit tests, do you run into problems with having to rewrite or throw away those tests when you were making some change to the code? Uh, How often do you run into to some degree, that just don't yeah. Anymore? Yeah, I mean, I think there is probably some carrying costs. I'm not sure what the percent, you know, five percent of the effort may be. Um, I think it's a bigger issue when we get into integration and end to end, and you get these really? kind of hidden dependencies. Um, uh, I would think it would throw too much of an issue. In terms of thro throwing, okay, throwing out tests. I see what you're saying. Um, All right. If a guy spends four hours writing a test and four hours writing the code, and yeah. then three weeks later the code changes in some way, and now the test is invalid, you've got to spend more time fixing the test to make it valid with the new code than it yeah. would take to actually change the code. That's an interesting question. I think my my gut was, you know, we tend to be, you know, the the module, you know, we tend to be either we're not re uh, completely changing the functionality of a module. Usually it's we have new hardware coming in and we're you know, adding new functionality. So that I see it more in the interdependencies than I do with the, the module behaviors. How do you keep your, uh, your telemetry analysis uh, software in sync with the uh, Ah, That's a problem. So to your, to your question, you know, as we add metrics, how do then, does the analysis side of it stay synced up? Um, yeah, that's just something we have to coordinate with our team that manages the telemetry and it's like a checklist item for as the requirements are coming in. Okay, can we ingest this additional telemetry? Do we have the right, and I don't think we're doing a great job there. I think there's opportunity to add tooling as we go. Um, so let me make sure I get through one last thing and say, here's another book recommendation. Uh, so um, Nicole Forsgren and Jess Humble and Gene Kim did a huge survey of software organizations looking at which uh, you know, which metrics seem to most correlate. Um, it's kind of like what Ron was doing too, that most correlate with team performance. Um, these were the main metrics they came out with. Uh, and there might be a bias towards, you know, sort of non-hardware projects, but I'm, I'm, I'm gonna co-op these for hardware related. Uh, deployment frequency, which I'm gonna take to deploying internally to internal teams. Lead time to getting a change in and through. Uh, and then how quickly can you restore service if there's a failure that got, uh, that got through um, some level of testing. So in brief, our first instrument, two weeks, you know, it took us days to get through um, and recover from failures. Second instrument, we're going to daily builds. We're starting to kind of pick up the pace for things. And then now we're starting to do four tests a day. And I now have some finding find some metrics on our change failure rates because we're tracking it. So we're about one out of every 80 commits will cause a failure in our standard tests. Um, but it takes only about 14 hours to then get to that failure uh, identify it, fix it, turn around, and get another test through. So that's kind of our rate right now. I don't think, you know, in my world, we'll ever get to the sub-hour lead times um, or ability to restore quickly. I mean, there's just so much friction when we're dealing with real hardware, but I'm happy with this. When it says restore service, is that would, would rolling back to a version just before the test? Yeah. Equipment yeah. Or if you had a... So it's not about fixing... Necessarily. Yeah, it's restoring it's service. Making sure that the, the system comes back up in a usable state. Yeah. So, or in as good a state as well. So if you had a feature that was feature flagged and you could quickly revert it, yeah. I think, yeah, I might, you could get down there with a feature flag scenario for me, but generally not. This this might be the money slide. Like, this is a relative scale of the effort between these instruments. So as we added all of this tooling, the amount of effort in terms of person uh, months of work is steadily decreasing. Um, we're not firing anyone. This is just people doing other things. <laughs> <laughs> so, popping way back to your simulation stuff, what, at what level are you doing your, your, your simulation down to? The, the, I, the goal was to have our application or production code not know the difference, so wherever that line was. Okay. Uh, but, uh, you know, where to find it where it makes sense for you. 
Um, now we can go to concurrent development. So we're doing software for both at the same time, same code base. This is, a place, this is a fun place to work in that customers get our sequencers and they'd like to take pictures with them and post them on Twitter. This is just from the last month. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, one last, you know, sorry to run over a little bit. One last story I was going to say is um, I had a, a friend who's a pilot. We were going to go take a trip to Nevada. And he said, oh, well, let's borrow my instructor's plane. We'll fly out there. And being Feeling immortal at the time, I thought, oh, no problem. Sure, OK. Uh, so we, we fly to San Carlos, we start, we start heading you know, towards Nevada. He's talking me through all the things the instructor advises him to him. So I'm thinking, maybe this wasn't the best idea. Uh, but he's like, we're going to fly by the highway, we're going to be at 10,000 feet in case anything goes wrong, we can land somewhere, we're always paying attention to where the local airport is. So sure enough, we get to Sacramento and we start hearing that tick, 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 tick sound. Now, it's really loud in these planes. You have sound canceling headphones on, and I'm like, what's that? And then he, Looks, listens. Oh, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> but because he's also an engineer, the first thing he wants to do is, well, let's see what happens when I do this. So he puts the throttle in. The sound gets quieter. He pulls the throttle out. It gets louder. Okay, all right. Uh, and then, and then he pulls it all the way out. Sure enough, the engine goes. <laughs> and I, at, at at this moment, I'm thinking, can that sound it bad? But the propeller's still turning, so you know, can't be that bad, right? The propeller's turning. I find out later that the propeller will turn just from the wind. <laughs> I think it started to get real for me when uh, when he called Sacramento's air traffic control and and they said, "How many souls are on board?" That was the question. Um, but we had done everything right. Uh, we diverted to this little tiny Auburn airport, um, and. Uh, there's all these retirees that basically are volunteers at these small airports, right? So there's these volunteers on the radio, and he calls, oh, I have an engine out, emergency landing. And they, say, and they think it's a student practicing. So, oh, real or simulated? He says, real. And they go, oh, my God. <laughs> Everybody get off the runway. <laughs> <laughs> so we got there with plenty of altitude. We had to circle a while before we could land. Of course, you only have one shot at landing, so you get really nervous. And came in and landed just fine. And they came out running, they're all excited. Patted my friend in the back, did a great job. Um, but one thing that he had said to me uh, after this was, the most common mistake you make when these situations happen is you start troubleshooting, of course. Um, and like, you know, you start looking at the fuel valve and you start looking at your instruments and you forget to fly the plane. Uh, so his instructor said, just fly the plane. So my, my, I've used this so many times, like my dad is driving me somewhere recently and he's getting confused with the navigation. He's swerving, I'm like, dad, just fly the plane. And he says, I'm not flying a plane. <laughs> <laughs> in my work context, it comes up for me because you know, for each, each organization, for my organization, applying the agile practices, it's gonna depend on your organization. Um, you know, you still have a, you know, we're still doing a job, we're still delivering value to a customer. Uh, you know, I feel like a lot of these practices, it really depends on the people involved, what your culture is like, what you can, you know, kind of innovate with. Um, so my final takeaway is um, you have to fly the plane. And then